Hello everyone, this is Jabra Ghanim. We're going to do more of the Old Testament uh, from Genesis. We're going to do chapters 15 to 17, which continues the story of our father Abraham. Again, this is, this is from the part the Jews call Lech Lecha, which means let's go, get up and go. Because Abraham is always on the go as we've seen earlier in the story now this is this part is is very is very personal to me it all it's always touching to me and um it's it's really enlightening to read through there is a lot here more than i, I can cover in a small segment but i'm gonna start with this part of the story where abraham or abram still at this point receives uh, a revelation, uh, receives a vision, and the Lord is telling him, I'm your shield, don't be scared, you will have a great reward. At this point in time, Ab Abram is very old. He is still, he is still without children. Now, remember when I spoke way earlier about the culture of the area, People, people in those days wanted to be remembered. They wanted to have a posterity, but they wanted also to be remembered. And the way Semitic tribes, the way Semitic tribes like to be remembered, they, they are all about la remember land and people. Land and people. That's how you get to remember, by leaving behind a posterity. Uh, who pray for you, who remember you, who remember your good works. Etc. Uh, Etc. Et so the Lord appears to him and he assures him. And Abram pours his heart out and he says, "I'm still without children." And uh, what? And the person I've put over my house is is a stranger. Basically, his name is Eliezer uh, of Damascus. So. Yesterday, or in the previous segment, I spoke about the Nuzi tablets. Uh, the Nuzi tablets were found in, in uh, Iraq, out in the, in the area of Kirkuk, I believe. And they discovered in them, it's a huge library of clay books. And they discovered in them some documents that shed lights on customs and traditions of the people in that, in that area. And one of those customs is is uh, this tradition of if you don't have an heir then the head of your household can become your heir so abram at this point he's already had a covenant he's already had a berit with god he's already been promised posterity he's been already promised that by the lord but he's still in doubt as he ages he is increasing in doubt so Trusting in his own worldly wisdom, he goes and, and assigns this person to inherit him. So the, this is this is Abraham's doing. But the Lord here is giving him assurances of all sorts. So he shows him a vision of the planets and the, and the stars, and he asks him to count, which is impossible. So Abraham basically is told, "Your your posterity will outnumber that." outnumber that and then he also promises him land and makes another covenant with him with a sign this time and the sign is you know you have these animals and the animals are being cut and then he has to walk across them and then the lord comes in in a pillar of fire and smoke and walks through them and that is an ancient again from the newsy uh, news tablets and other uh, documentary evidence from the area this is how kings this is how kings uh, make agreements so this is what I've talked about earlier this type of covenant is what what you call a, a Caesarean vassal kind of covenant where you know a, a high king and a lower king are making an agreement and you know the higher king is the Lord so this covenant is made and but here is what i found intriguing in this in this part of the story having a posterity isn't necessarily a good thing i mean it's good and it's not good because abram is shown abram is shown that 
his posterity will also be estranged. His posterity will also be lech lecha. They will be on the move. They will also always be going and they will be enslaved in a foreign country. And the reference here is to the enslavement of the Israelites in Egypt uh, for 400 years. And the number 400, I'll come to it later, but one of its significances, uh, the number four and 400 is at least in rabbinic literature, that they assign the number 400 to hardship, to hardship. So 400 years. So he's telling him, yeah, you're going to have this posterity, but they are going to go through hardship and trouble and they are not, you know, they're not going to be all that great. So, but I'm going to give it to you and you will go back to your fathers in peace and you will be, you will be buried in peace and you will you will be buried in righteousness and then he tells him he also promises him that the fourth generation will return to will return to that land that he inherited inherited and then he basically assigns the territory from the river of egypt which you we assume is the nile to the river euphrates and this is a loaded promise that reverberates to this day uh, as an Arab, even though I'm a Christian, it you know it it's, doesn't sit easy with me because I don't believe in the concept of 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 God assigning assigning land like that. But it is what's in the Bible. It is what's in the Torah. So we will take it just for what it is right now. Now uh, in chapter sixteen we get to another conflict. So we have Sarai, whose name has not been changed yet. And when we get introduced earlier to her, we're told that she's barren. Now that is, in that, cult, in that culture, in that era, is considered a great shame. The word used is barren. The word words used to describe a woman who doesn't have children and in those days they they assumed it's always the woman's fault it's always because the woman must have done something evil or wasn't good or she's being punished by the gods that she's not having children and they would call her a broken vessel sometimes because they assumed that it's the woman's fault and no blame was assigned to the man I'm sure there were men who who were barren, so to speak, and couldn't have children, but they didn't have the medical information to medical uh, te te technology and knowledge to be able to determine that. So it was always assigned to the woman. And so Sarai, the princess, is is just is just in in pain and anguish because she can't have children and she probably can't handle the backbiting, the shame, the speaking behind your back. So again, from the Nuzi tablets, we know that this was a tradition in Mesopotamia. She has this, uh, this uh, slave girl from Egypt whose name is Hagar or Hagar. Hagar is the way it's spelled in, in Arabic and I believe in Hebrew. I need to, I need to look. But Hagar or Hagar, which uh, which her name means flight, flight. Uh, this is, for example, where the Arabic word hijra comes from to, uh, to immigrate. Uh, and the second part of her name, Ghar, is also a play on Gharib or stranger, which I also believe is the same in, in Arabic and, and Hebrew. So Hagar is, is this concubine, is a slave, and so... Sarai follows this tradition and she says to Abram, not trusting in the promises of the Lord that they will have their own children, she uh, offers to give Abram his, her, her uh, slave girl to, uh, to Abram. And Abram does it. Abram wants to just because his wife says, if, you, if I don't have children, I'm going to die. And so he loves Sarai so much that he just does it. Uh, not sure that that would have been the choice I would have made if I was in the same circumstances, but he does it and she gets a child. Now, Hagar or Hagar 
is pregnant that is that causes sort of I'm sure mixed feelings in the family but uh, ha Hagar also uh, sort of starts acting against Sarai so in the story this is a story about it, one of those biblical stories where you have this complex dynamic where there isn't there isn't an absolute right or wrong and you have to have some empathy to see every point of view because even though my heart is with with Hagar and she is the oppressed and abused party in this relationship not only she's a slave she's forced into a sexual relationship with a man who is probably way older than her but she she's also failing to to have some empathy and maybe some humility so she she starts acting against uh, against uh, Sarai probably being snobby uh, now that she's pregnant she's uh, sort of some schadenfreude is going on so Sarai can't handle it and she goes complaining to Abram and Abram basically you know, a human being with his faults, he's our father, he's not perfect, but he's, he's without his faults. Uh, he's, he basically delivers Hagar into Sarai's hands, do with her whatever you want. Now the scripture tells us that contrary to how we might imagine the scenario playing, the scriptures are clear. Abram says, she's in your hands, do with her what you want. And the scriptures uh, say, at least in the Sadia Gawon Arabic translation and in the Samaritan translation, Sur uh, Sarai, uh, the word used is the word for torture or overburdening. She was overburdening her. She overburned her so much that Hagar chose to run away. And so she is, and this is this is a, a huge part of the story. It's this is where Muslims and Jews differ because in the sto the Islamic story, Hagar is uh, uh, in the is in the Islamic story, Hagar runs away, and uh, Ishmael basically gets the promise. And Ishmael gets a promise, but it's not the same promise that Isaac later will get. And we'll talk about this this later on. I'll come back to this story briefly when I talk about uh, Isaac. But the Lord here is showing compassion to Hagar, and that's the part of the story, is to show us that the Lord has compassion to those who are oppressed and those who are in slavery and uh, situations like Hagar and so he gives her this amazing blessing and he tells her to call her son Ishmael because El God has heard you Ishma God has heard you so he has heard you and he gives him this promise and uh, that he will have this amazing posterity and he will be controlling in that area and etc 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 and Ishmael gets born. So Hagar goes back, trusting in the promise of the Lord, shows great faith because she runs away from the Sarai's oppression, but then trusting in the promise of God, she goes back. And Abram does the right thing. And this is a very important detail in the story. Ab Ishmael is born and Abram blesses him. So gives him his legitimacy so finally in chapter 17 Abram is 99 years old so far no children because even though Ishmael is his child the Nusi tablets again talk about similar situations because he's the son of a concubine he can be excluded and so Abram still needs an heir that he can, can, who is legitimate, who is a legitimate heir. And the Lord shows him, uh, shows up to him, uh, and at 99, he has a vision, and he says just, be obedient and be right. And he's telling him this for a reason, because Abram has so far failed to keep faith with the Lord and have, and believe in the Lord's promises. He's 
appointed this Eliezer of Damascus. He's had a, a son with a concubine. So he's, he's still not showing complete faith. And then he renews the, this is what's called the Abrahamic covenant B. So the one in chapter 15 is A, this is B. And he gives him a covenant. It's pretty much the same, but then there is a sign. And the sign is the Berit Milah. The Berit, berit remember, is the word for covenant. And, and Milah is circumcision. Every Jew at eight days of life, once a Jewish baby boy is born at eight days, even on the Sabbath, you circumcise that that child. And that is the sign of the covenant. And there is a famous story from Josephus when the Romans wanted to prevent the Jews from having the Berit Milah, from having circumcision. Jewish women chose to die, chose to be burned, rather than not circumcise their children. So that is a very important, very important uh, uh, ordinance in, in Judaism to this day. And so that part of the covenant is, uh, is established and there is a change of name. From Abram, elevated father, to Abraham or Ibrahim, as we say in Arabic, father of nations. Again, more affirmation, Abraham, you are going to have children and you're going to have this massive posterity. And so Abraham, probably in frustration, I'm sure not meaning any disrespect, uh, and the Lord as a compassionate, super empathetic being he is, I'm sure he understood where the laughter came from. Abraham laughs. And later on, we will hear about Sarai, whose name will change to Sarah, which again means princess. And he basically says, not only you will have Ishmael, and from Ishmael will come 12 tribes, of whom I'm a part, but you will, but my covenant, I will affirm, my covenant, I will affirm with Yeshak. And Yeshak means to laugh, because the Lord, the Lord, you know, under, saw Abraham laughing. And so Yishak is going to be the one with the promise and circumcision will be the sign. And on that day, Ab Abram or Abraham now, father of nations, father of a soul, uh, Abraham Avinu, as the, as the Jews say, went and circumcised everyone in the household, everyone born in his household, every stranger in his household, and Ishmael, and established the covenant in the house. So lesson, lesson learned from this story for me is that when you have a promise from the Lord, when the Lord has promised you something, you believe it. And you work as if the Lord has fulfilled that promise, because He will. I know He will. Uh, he is a loving Father. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He doesn't change, and He's not going to change His word. We just have to wait for His right time and place to do things. And uh, Abraham, as righteous as he is, with all the visions he was receiving, he's seeing these glorious visions that we've read about in the Pearl of Great Price that we're reading about here. He is, he's still struggling, struggling. 99 years old, no children, but yet you're promised. How is it going to happen? It's, it's a huge question. And think about it when you know the Lord has promised you something and it just is not happening. Just think of this story. Uh, this is the end of this parsha of the Torah, this chapter of the Torah that's called Lech Lecha. And we will move to the next one. And uh, I'll tell you its name in the next segment. And it's very exciting and continues the story of Abraham. Uh, until then, thank you for watching.